Okay, so here we go. Let me get to the table. Table, 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 document cam. Okay. Okay, so the light is, okay, interesting. So now try to fill this table up by Wednesday because it's a good thing to study. If you wanted to add the phosphine gas, we've got a little technical difficulty, that's fine. Um, that's fine on the far right. I usually don't talk about phosphine gas, but if you haven't read the article yet, it's very freaky how it was generated and kill. I think it killed some people. But let me just point this out. Okay, so you got carbon monoxide, and here's the one thing you should write either above each of those chemical formulas, you should spell out the name. Like carbon monoxide. I just didn't have room, but you know, you could spell out. There's ammonia, there's methane up there, there's carbon dioxide. So first one is carbon monoxide, of course. And then the next one, silo gas, and these are articles too. Silo gas is actually NO2 plus CO2. But I didn't put the data for CO2 because it's under methane gas, or under the manure pit gases, see? So instead of making two columns for CO2, I just kind of put this in parentheses just to make the point that silo gas is two gases. But I just put, I want the data for the NO2 on the column here because CO2 is mentioned over there. So then the manure pit gases is a combination of four gases. And so then I spread those out because you should know the, the names of those chemical formulas, right? Now the interesting thing about manure pit gas is it, it, it's actually surrounding this building right now underground. All the sewers that are around here have manure pit gases in them, okay? And then that far one is radon. You could write that on top, Rn. That's, that's the chemical formula for radon. Okay, so then the one, call, the one row across I'm going to help you with right now is the density. And then I'm going to tell you the numbers, and then I'm going to show you this one book that has all the chemicals in the world in it. So if you're ever studying something and it's a weird chemical, I've got the book right up here. Look how thick it is. Every chemical known to man is in this book. This one's a little past. It's not the newest edition, so I might be lying a little bit if you have the newest edition. But anytime you read about some chemical or some poison, it's in here. Okay? So let's go across. You remember from you, what was the uh, density of carbon monoxide? 0 0.968. So then I said that's really close to 1, right? So then in one sense, it doesn't matter where the detector is because, you know, it's mixing with air. Now here's one thing, you, if you ever work with gases or something, there's one thing that will, even if a gas is really heavy, one of, there's one of these that are really heavy, it can still be found at the ceiling. And what, this happens when you're in buildings. It's called forced convection. Forced convection can move these gases and put them irrespective of what the density is. And we have that happening in this room right now. All those vents, I'm not sure if those are, those are probably inlets for air. Anytime there's a fan or a motor moving air, that's called forced convection. And so there might be a gas that's very heavy, and if your furnace is in the basement, the furnace will suck in the air right from the basement and put it up on the third floor. So something very heavy that's maybe originating in the basement can be found in the attic because of the forced convection. You've got to remember that. And then since a little side light, we're talking about convection, there's two types of convection. You know there was forced convection, and that's got to be some kind of fan running, something mechanical. Anybody tell me what the other kind of convection is? Natural convection. So like hot air rises, even if there's no motor around, right? And that's the, the uh, definition of natural convection. And when you design buildings, like every time a dairy barn's designed and you got a lot of cows in it out in the free stalls, 
they take big advantage of natural convection. If you've ever walked through some of those dairy barns, there's no, uh, there's an opening down the, the peak. Why? Because hot air from the cows will naturally follow the roof line and go out without any fan of yours. And what, what that happens is then cooler air is drawn in down below. That's natural convection. So these, the density is you gotta be careful because if there's some fan moving, I don't care how heavy something is, it can go from the basement to the fifth floor, right? So you gotta be careful. Okay, so 0 0.968 was carbon monoxide. The next one, NO2, now remember, I'm gonna give you a number for NO2, CO2 comes later, right? Uh, NO2, sil part of silo gas, 1.58. And we're going to see how, if you're not familiar with upright silos, they don't have a lot of airflow. They, you know, the top tends to be dead. And then the silo gas sits there waiting for somebody. Okay? Unless you use forced convection, which is the way to get rid of it. Okay, so I'm going across CH4. <clears throat> and if you want to write on top, methane. I'm giving you some hints here. 0 0.554. So quite lighter than air. So that's going to go up, but you know it could be low too, depending on if there's a fan running around. Then we have uh, H2S 1.19. And remember, these are arbitrary units. It's all relative to air. Right? If air, you set air as one, and then these numbers say if it's higher, lighter or heavier than air. Then we've got CO2, 1.527, so heavier than air. Then NH3, 0 0.597. And then I'll just make a comment. You'll look at those, and two of the manure pit gases are lighter than air, and two are heavier. And so you might say, well, then when they're generated in the manure pit, wouldn't those two that are lighter than air dissipate? And the answer is no, they're trapped in the manure. Okay? And then if you stir the manure up, everything gets released. And that's one of the problems. Okay, so then radon, listen to this. This is the winner for density, 7.5. Okay, anybody have any questions on that? So that's the table. I'll let, and on Wednesday, when we leave here, we need to know everything. Here's the book that has all the chemicals in it. And let's see. <coughs> Sorry for the lighting here. Okay. Um, oops, sorry. I guess I don't know how to do that. Uh, there we go. The Merck Index. There we go. Now, the 8th edition is quite old. I've got many copies of this, and this is just the one I had in my office shelf. But there's, it's probably the 18th edition now. I mean, this is when probably when I was in graduate school. The Merck Index. Every chemical in the world, I turn, I'll turn the page to radon, and maybe I'll, I'll, I still haven't mastered these lights, but okay, I'm not mastering them. Let's see. There's radon. So it goes on and on, and I got all those numbers of density from that book. Okay, even if the uh, edition is like 20 years old, is the density still probably accurate? Probably didn't change, right? What this book might lack is some of the latest chemicals. So every chemical in the book, every chemical in the world is in this book, which is interesting. Okay? So if you ever have insomnia at night, get one of these, open it, and it's all chemistry, uh, and you're not off, and it'll be fine for insomnia. Okay. So <laughs> let me get over and start talking about silo gas. Okay, so then you've got some of these um, uh, clicks here. Well, one thing, one of the clicks talks about oxygen percent. And I thought this was very interesting. 
because sometimes you don't always find this. This is a table of, well, a slight table of percent oxygen in the atmosphere and then the health effects. You know, and we've talked about it, 21% of the air is oxygen. And what's most of the other stuff? 78% nitrogen. Very little carbon dioxide, maybe a little radon, depends where you live, a little other things, but not much. If you go down to 19.8, you're probably still okay. But then if you get down to 16% oxygen, your judgment is impaired. Notice there's a typo there. That's not how you spell impaired. There's I in front of that. So impaired breathing and judgment, faulty judgment, rapid fatigue for 14, and then of course you get down to six and you'll get death. Anyway, there are some factories that you can work at that don't have 21% oxygen in the room. Sometimes they get down to 19. Okay, so anyway, so let me go back to here, and so let me give you a big summary about silo gases. Okay, there's a silo, if you're not familiar with that. I'm going to click off my recording here for a second. Okay, upright silos, this was the most dangerous part, because if you're not familiar with them, they're not as popular as they used to be, but you've got this big, tall thing, it might be made of concrete, remember the, the blue harvesters, I don't know if that was metal or whatever that was. They're usually um, top on loading. There's a, there's a mechanism up on top that twirls around on the top and it shoots down um, the silage down a chute and then you have like a wagon down below or you're collecting the silage. So what happens is when it's first filled in the fall, that's when the silo gas is formed. So it's within like one or two weeks is the most dangerous. So on top, think of this tube on top. On top of this silage sits this silo gas, but there's no place for it to escape because if you look at your chart, it's heavier than air. And there are no fans running up there. And you know, it can be cold, well, maybe not cold when it's harvested, but the point is the silo gas sits there and if somebody, if, and here's, the, here's the, what happens. Let's say the silage on loader that's on top, it's a mechanical thing that's chipping away at the silage. If it breaks down or needs some repair, somebody climbs up, there's always a chute on the side, and goes into the um, silo and the gas is sitting there. And one breath can kill you, okay? And if you read it, the um, you breathe this in and it turns into an acid and it basically chemically destroys your lungs. I mean, eats your lungs apart, really. And there was one story, so on the table it talks about deaths, right, per year. Doesn't it say something about that? Something like US deaths per year? This is rare, maybe one or two or three, so I'm not helping you fill that table out. It's only if somebody goes up and repairs that on loader and it's recently filled. Okay, so you might say, how do you get rid of it? Because you might have to repair it. There's a way to blow air up. It's like the same thing that loaded the silage. You can run a blower and run it for an hour and then your, your gas is all gone. But there was a case, the last one I remember was in Wisconsin. Dad was gonna work on the farm and the family, the wife and kids, went shopping. So they said goodbye to dad. They got home that evening, late afternoon, and they couldn't find dad. And one, somebody said, oh, maybe he went and did something up in the silo, we better find him. He was dead up in the silo because, okay, he was by himself, first of all, probably not the thing to do, right? Uh, but he went in there and it was recently filled and there was probably, you know, that much of dead airspace. And he went in there, took a breath, the NO2 combines with water and makes an acid and eats the lung. So um, that's a sad story. And I always say, you know, all these stories about carbon monoxide and all that, it's something to learn from, right? So. Very rare, because now the other thing is, those upright silos aren't very popular anymore. 
they've went to bunker, haven't they? I mean, some of you farm people, it's like out at the animal science farms, they're still the upright, but there's a lot of bunkers too, and you just, and like at um, Fair Oaks Dairy, they have huge bunkers. Do they have any silos at all? Anybody remember, see, I've been up there a number of times, I don't think there's any upright silos. It's all, you put silage down on the ground and drive tractors on it, try to get all the air out, cover them up with plastic and tires, and you've got fresh silage all winter, and you have a face, and you eat off the face. But So very rare, but still something to think about. Now the other thing about it is, if that gas came down, it, it, if it had a route to go down, and this silo was connected to a barn, the barn could be full of the silo gas, right? If it came, remember there's like a, a side chute that people could climb up, silage goes up, but gas could come down. So if you had some opening, that gas could fall into the barn, right? So that silo gas, read the whole stories, whatever. I'm gonna go on. And I'm gonna go on to the manure pit gases. And this is probably the saddest stuff. Um, <clears throat> and there, there's probably all kinds of stories, but that's where that one is at. Maybe the other one has, uh, let's see, okay. Let's see, okay, yeah, five. Now this is a while ago, 2007, so a little over 10 years ago. Gas from manure pit kills five. Okay. So here, if you're not familiar with a manure pit, they're maybe not as popular as they used to be, but a lot of times in hog confinement buildings, the swine are on a floor, there's slats. The manure, the urine, the water, the feed goes down into this pit. And we're talking about, if it's a big barn, millions of gallons, okay, of this stuff. And it gets really thick and Sometimes people need to go down and maybe maybe they're unloading it or yeah take, pumping it out. I guess I probably should say something happens with a, with a piece of equipment. I can't remember the exact story, but one I remember, and you guys can read this. Something fell into the manure, a piece of something that they were working on, and um, and maybe it's this case. So one person went down to pick up this thing that from some pump or something that dropped into the manure pit. Well, first of all, remember there's four gases, and none of them work like carbon monoxide. You know, carbon monoxide binds to the hemoglobin. None of these other gases do any of that, but it excludes oxygen. So when you go down, there's 0% oxygen. And then you take a breath, and you've got all these other noxious gases, and you basically are paralyzed right there, okay? So then here's what happens. Person one goes down, gets into trouble. Well, then person two wants to go help, right? I mean, your natural instinct. Person two gets into trouble. So this is like one, two, three, four, five. It wasn't five at one time. It was one person got into trouble, the next person tried to help, then the next person, then the next person, then the next person, five sequentially over time, not five at one time. So the key is, you should, you know, the, when these manure pit gases are that dangerous, and they're out in the sewers around campus. They're, they're made wherever manure is fermenting. Manure, fecal matter, right? No different out in the sewers than in the manure pit gases. So very dangerous, it basically paralyzes your breathing. Somebody gets in trouble, somebody wants to help. And it would be hard to stand up there and not go help, wouldn't it? But you would save everybody behind you. But it's an impulse thing. So the key is education. Know this might happen. Don't go down there ever unless you have like a breathing device, right? So they're very dangerous. Another thing that used to happen with, when they first came out, this was years ago, they didn't realize how toxic, toxic this gas was. And sometimes they left the animals in the barn or in the confinement barn above the manure pit when they were emptying it out, when they were pumping it out. And um, you pump this out into a big wagon, and then you can go spread it on a field, or sometimes you can pump it out directly like, and 
spread it on a field. But once you, to pump it out, you aggregate, you uh, agitate everything. You get everything mixed up. That releases all those gases. And some people, this was years ago, lost every animal in that barn. They all died. Because where are the swine? Are they up here five feet above the floor? If the manure pit is full, they're just a foot away from the surface of the gas. And so some people, not realizing how dangerous it was, would start the pump and it would, you know, it's agitating everything, getting it all ready to be pumped out. And on the notes to them, all the animals in the barn died. I mean, hundreds. I should probably find one article and put it there. It doesn't happen as often now because more people are aware of it. Odin's underneath. So some relatives spread out this very powerful rat poison. I'm not even sure exactly what it was. Maybe one of the, some of the reading will tell you. So it's kind of benign, but it makes phosphine gas if there's a lot of water around. So this is like an you know, accident waiting to happen. Some relatives said, oh, I know how to get rid of those rats. So he spread all this uh, rodenticide you know, pesticide basically underneath there. And it was so moist and the pipes were leaking water, right, condensation and stuff. It made gas and then it killed four, four kids, I think, in this, because of the phosphine gas that was given off. Now right offhand, and so I don't remember if it's lighter than air or heavier than air. And maybe what I can do is put this Look over here and have one of the TAs look up phosphine gas. Colleen, see if it's in there. Let's see if my book that has every chemical in the world <laughs> has phosphine gas. The thing is, my guess that it's lighter than air, but why could it still get into the trailer house if it was really heavy? Forced convection. Maybe a furnace was running air conditioner that draws air through underneath and puts it in the, to the trailer house? I don't know. Phosphine gas. It, the, she's, yeah. Anyway, so this will still be on the test even if it's on, not on the table. So maybe what I'll do is I'll try, well, if she can't find it there, because it might, that's the other thing about finding things in the book. If you can't find it alphabetically in the back, it's got another index because sometimes gases are named two or three with two or three different names, right? And you might, it might be someplace else. So, so this was like a weird incident, incident, a freak accident. But you should be aware that okay, maybe I shouldn't spread that rat poison, and I'm sure it's different ones. Colleen, did you find it? We can't find the density, but it does say that after 60 parts per million, it's legal. Okay, after 60 parts per million? Yeah. yeah. And maybe we'll try, we'll try to find something about it for Wednesday. I'm pretty, maybe it's, you know, sometimes you have to go someplace else in that book to find the density. It's not super clear. And it might give the density, the absolute density relative, rather than giving it relative to air, right? And maybe I've calculated out for this table those other densities. Because, you know, it could be grams per liter of air. That's what it says on the yeah. Uh, Wikipedia? 1.379 grams per liter. Okay, let's write that down. 1.379 yes. grams per liter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, and so I don't know, because I can't remember what the density of air is, right? It's going to be so many grams per liter. And for our table, I maybe calculated, I did this a couple of years ago, I probably calculated them out, calculated them out relative to air. So we'll check on that. Okay, anybody got any questions on that? If not, I'm going to stop right there and start on those other chemicals, sweet clover poisoning on Wednesday. And when you leave Wednesday, you'll know exactly what has on, what's on the test. For